Então, pessoal, boa noite. Bem-vindos aí ao, à terceira sessão do Psicologia no Sofá com o Charles Catania. É, quem perdeu as primeiras, as primeiras uh, aulas vão estar disponíveis logo no nosso canal no YouTube, que é Psicologia no Sofá, mas é, né, vai demorar, o pessoal da nossa equipe está tá trabalhando bastante e teve bastante o, o volume né, de atividades, acabou aumentando muito é, devido ao grande sucesso da, da aula com o Charlie. E, então, a gente vai começar a parte 3. No final, a gente abre para perguntas. Então, vocês podem ir mandando as perguntas de vocês ou no Q&A aqui embaixo ou no chat. Eu acredito que hoje vai dar tempo de fazer perguntas. We'll see, right, Charlie? I'm telling them that, like, if they got questions, they can send their questions in. Uh, maybe we'll have time for that tonight. We'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. E... Bom, é isso. Eu quero aproveitar. A gente vai começar, mas eu queria... Estava conversando com o pessoal agora há pouco. E, e a... só queria dizer para vocês que são interessados em análise do comportamento, querem estudar um pouco mais. O programa de pós-graduação em análise do comportamento da Universidade Estadual de Londrina é o programa onde a maioria de nós, do pessoal da comissão, se formou, né, terminou o mestrado e tal. E é um programa que deu muita base para a gente né, em várias áreas. E, enfim, vocês podem olhar lá no site da UEL e ter mais informações sobre o programa de pós-graduação em análise do comportamento da Universidade Estadual de Londrina. E se vocês tiverem dúvidas, quiserem saber sobre a gente, mandem e-mail lá no Psicologia no Sofá arroba gmail.com, saber sobre a gente que eu diga, até a nossa opinião do programa, a gente pode, é, com muito prazer, falar para vocês. Well, Charlie, uh, back to you. Ok, well, so we get into the 1960s. I mean, this is beginning to be uh, uh, a time which grows larger and larger as we look at the history, because there are things going on in the 60s that are reminiscent of things going on today. But in the world, in, in the greater picture of things going on in the world, some of the memorable events in the 1960s were that uh, uh, the mixing and the economy of things going on in the Cold War between Russia and the United States uh, led the Germany, eventually to West, East Germany, to divide Berlin and build a wall. In 1962, uh, Khrushchev tried to put missiles in Cuba, uh, atomic missiles, and there was a crisis at that time in which people around in those days literally worried about whether we'd suddenly be facing a nuclear war. It seemed very real at the time. In the United States, uh, we've had uh, continuing issues over racism and And uh, in those days, there were still many parts of the United States where there was segregation in schools and restaurants and things. And the civil rights movement became a very big movement that did create some changes, but it was all complicated by the other things that were going on. For example, the United States was getting more and more entangled in Vietnam during the 1960s. Of course, I'm compressing a lot into this story. Uh, in 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated His assassination figures large in the rest of the 20th century, just as Lincoln's assassination after the American Civil War uh, figured largely, because after Lincoln's assassination, many of the things that were going to be changed because of the Civil War got rolled back. So there was nowhere near as much progress as there might have been. There were cultural changes. The Beatles came to the United States in 1964 and so they had already been big in Europe um, but in it's not long after that that Martin Luther King was assassinated then Robert Kennedy uh, there was also the cultural movement that culminated in Woodstock in which you had uh, Bob Dylan and a lot of other folk singers Joan Baez becoming widely recognized and it was also tied to the issues of the war and we had the first moon landing So what were behavior analysts doing during all of this time, you may ask? Well, during the 60s, there was a lot going on. I'm not, there's just no possible way I could start discussing who was doing what in which laboratory and which particular findings were the hot findings in any particular year. 
uh, there were lots of important things coming along. Uh, people uh, discovered auto shaping, which showed that if you just operated the feeder, the turn on the pigeon light and operated the feeder, that the bird would begin pecking the key without you having to do shaping. Uh, there were questions about the boundaries then between what we called operant behavior and what we call respondent behavior. There was the beginnings of work where people were trying to do schedules of war enforcement with humans and finding that humans didn't really behave in very orderly ways. But those are the detailed pictures actually of what was going on in the science. The, the bigger picture was that there was research going on and it, I, I talked last time about how right from the very beginning, even the first issues of JAB, the Journal of the Experimental Analysis of Behavior, the issues included both basic and applied work. And if you look in those early issues, you'll find psychopharmacology in there, you'll find work with children, you'll find work with human adults, you'll find some work with verbal behavior. Uh, about the only thing that's changed over the next 50 years was that throughout those, that half a century that followed, there began to be less and less work on aversive control. And we talked just a little bit about that. But all the people who were doing things in those days um, were people who were doing both basic and applied work, or not all of them, but an awful lot of them. Charlie Furster was working with uh, what were called psychotic children, while he was also doing basic work on schedules of reinforcement with both pigeons and monkeys and other, other organisms. Uh, Skinner was working on teaching machines, uh, very, very much interested in um, in education, while at the same time he was working with Charlie First Run, basic schedules of reinforcement. But the people doing that stuff were finding it hard to publish. And uh, so, uh, the, as I mentioned, in the 50s, JAB was created. It had been around for just a little while. Uh, but it, it began, as, as the time passed, there also were people moving into applications. Sid Bijou was working on developmental things out of Washington State. The University of Kansas was beginning to do things uh, also along the lines of applied behavior analysis. It was popping up all over the place and it began to be more than any one journal could handle. So the initial change and separation into the Journal of Ex the Experimental Analysis of Behavior and on the one hand, the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, on the other hand, mainly came about for practical reasons. Uh, no one editor could handle all of that stuff. It made sense to, uh, uh, rather than to have to sort things and have one person deciding these manuscripts should go here, the separate journal J Jabba was founded. Uh, the people who were most important in founding it were Nate Azrin, uh, along, uh, who was doing work with Ted Ione uh, on, uh, in psychiatric wards because Nate had taken a position at Anna State Hospital in Indiana and had been doing a lot of his work there. Uh, they were developing the token economy and that became a, a thing of substantial interest, but the early papers were published in, in JAB. Okay. And, okay. and then there were other people coming along um, and, and Charlie, three of the Charlie. most... Hmm? Oh, you want to translate? Okay, sure. Oh my God. Um, oh, I thought all of the important things were said on the side here, right? Oh, but go yeah, ahead. I go ahead. I'll let you talk. Of, <laughs> uh, you added a lot of important things, right? Uh, you know, na, na década de 60, como o trabalho estava aumentando muito, e não só o trabalho, as pessoas estavam se envolvendo com análise de comportamento é, em vários lugares diferentes dos Estados Unidos, e de várias formas diferentes, e, a maior, e uma boa parte dessas pessoas trabalhava tanto com pesquisa aplicada quanto com pesquisa experimental, uh, por razões práticas, eu não sei se... Charlie, can you hear me? Yeah, oh yeah. Ah, ok, got you, because I had the impression that I got frozen. Um, por razões práticas... Foi criado... I, I don't understand all that you're saying in Portuguese. Oh, oh. But I'm, I'm making some guesses. <laughs> I'm talking about how good you are. Uh, foram criadas por, por, razão, por razões de, de praticidade, criou-se um periódico diferente, que é o JABA, né? o jornal, a revista de análise aplicada do comportamento. E ele foi criado pelo Azrin lá, que estava trabalhando em Indiana, num, num, na parte psiquiátrica. Ele trabalhava, e o Ferster também, que 
trabalhava com o que eles chamavam antes de crianças psicóticas. E, e foi como os editores não davam conta de, de lidar com todo o trabalho que vinha para uma revista só, que era o GEAB, que no começo tinha publicações não só de, de, de coisas experimentais, tinha um monte, tinha publicação na área, de, na área aplicada também, na área de psicofarmacologia, mas para aliviar o trabalho dos editores, nesse contexto, se criou o, o JABA, que é a revista de análise de comportamento aplicado. Thanks, Charlie. Ok. So, the, 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 it was then necessary to find uh, some people who were willing to do this work, and that was easy to do. Don Baer had been doing a lot of applied work with children with de developmental disabilities, Mont Wolf and Todd Risley uh, were involved in uh, Owen Boys Town and, uh, and in, in other places. And actually, so working with children, uh, working with behavior problems, and the stuff was actually quantitative. People had data to present. Um, and so the journal got launched. Um, it was pretty obvious to some people even then that there might be problems over the long run of dividing the field up that way because there's, there's always been this kind in, in any science uh the split between people who are actually doing the application so that for example engineers base a lot of their work on physics but physicists don't look at engineers as quite the same as, as status uh, but it took Uh, engineers getting together with physicists then to, to actually implement many of the things that came out of physics, uh, atomic energy and all of those kinds of things depended upon the, the work of those people together. Uh, so actually the history of every scientific field is one in which uh, the applications converge with the basic science and that's true in biology as we see it coming together in medicine as we see the advances in genetics uh, and the structure of DNA and so forth becoming involved in, in things we do like now, the importance of biology for dealing with the coronavirus. And uh -huh. I'm remembering to pause to give you a chance to get a word in. Sure. Uh, e para isso acontecer, para o Jabba ser, ser fundado, precisava de pessoas que tivessem dispostas e tivessem trabalho. Então aí o Don Bear, o Mount Wolf, Todd Risley, que estavam, uh, por exemplo, em Boys Town ou em outros lugares dos Estados Unidos fazendo pesquisa aplicada e tinham dados quantitativos para apresentar. E, foi, e aí nesse contexto sur, começa uh, o Java. E naquela época eles já imaginavam que pudesse existir problema. Uh, um problema de dividir as, os campos, né? Dividir experimental de um lado e aplicada de outro. Uh, só e, e daí ele deu o exemplo da, da engenharia e da física, por exemplo. Então os engenheiros eles precisam da física para para poder desenvolver o trabalho deles, mas os físicos muitas vezes não não, né? não reconhecem com a mesma o mesmo empenho o trabalho do, dos engenheiros. Uh, mas os dois para implementar, por exemplo, vários trabalhos precisam tra precisam precisam estar juntos, precisam as, as duas as, as, os braços diferentes eles precisam convergir. E, então é nesse contexto que então ele diz, né, a, 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 a parte experimental e a parte aplicada precisam uh, trabalhar juntos para poder desenvolver. Foi Charlie. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to move quickly through this and I'm going to expand on a couple of the topics here in, in a little bit. Uh, but lots of things became, were becoming controversial. There were many innovations, but also many controversies. So for example, Skinner had uh, often talked about superstition. He talked about delivering the reinforcer and it happened to follow some response. No contingency there, no causal relationship but nevertheless the response seemed to be increasing in frequency. Uh, e aí no, nos anos 60 Skinner começa a falar, por exemplo, sobre superstições. Uh, então a, a resposta é apresentada e ela tem uma consequência, mas na verdade não existe uma relação de contingência. A, a consequência não foi apresentada como consequência da resposta. But we now know that those accidental contingencies only have fairly temporary effects. 
They last for a little bit and then they disappear. E aí hoje a gente sabe que essas contingências acidentais, elas têm uma duração mais curta. Elas duram por um determinado período, mas elas desaparecem. But it made things difficult because it meant that uh, people were reluctant to deliver reinforcers independently of behavior. They thought that would create problems. Mas daí acabou criando um problema, porque as pessoas achavam que se elas liberassem reforço independente do comportamento, isso poderia criar situações problemáticas. And some people took that and, and actually criticized the entire field because of it. John Stadden being one example. E aí algumas pessoas pegaram isso e criticaram o, o campo inteiro por conta dessa, dessa questão. But the innovations included work by Sid Bijou, Don Baer, uh... Wolf and Risley, people I've just mentioned who were involved in the early uh, Java, who developed modeling and prompting and fading as ways of working with children. Uh, e aí acaba surgindo, por exemplo, outros pesquisadores, outros avanços, como o Bear, que foi é, o pessoal lá que, que, que fundou o ABA, ou estava no começo, é, desenvolvendo técnicas de modelação, de, de prompting. Uh, In the meantime, Charlie Furster, based on his work with children who were called psychotic children back then, began putting to, began the beginnings of a, of a behavioral theory of autism. First, I bet everybody could understand that without the translation. Yeah, right? I think that's here. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Now, there was another problem with respect to reinforcement historically. Aí tinha um outro problema com, com a, a questão do reforçamento historicamente, outro problema histórico. So... This response was reinforced, and then this response increased. Why did the response increase? Because it was reinforced. How do you know it was reinforced? Well, because it increased. There was this circular set of relationships. E aí tinha o problema era essas relações circulares. Então, por que que o comportamento ah, tem um comportamento? Comportamento aumentou. Por que o comportamento aumentou? Por causa da consequência. Por que que teve a consequência? Porque aconteceu o comportamento. Essas relações circulares. Um, but then along came Dave Premack, uh, who started thinking about reinforcement in terms of the relative probabilities of the response to be reinforced and the response that produces the reinforce and the responses that are, are occasioned by the reinforcer. Ah, uh, então Premack vem e desenvolve um princípio falando sobre a relatividade mesmo do a, a, a probabilidade de uma resposta produzir um o um, um reforço. So, if some low prob probability response gives you an opportunity to engage in a higher probability response, uh, then that is what will work as a reinforcer. So, if you're not very likely to take a drink, but you're highly likely to eat, you can use eating to reinforce drinking. E esse princípio envolvia, se eu tenho um comportamento que tem menor probabilidade de acontecer e um outro com maior probabilidade de acontecer, eu posso usar esse comportamento com maior probabilidade de acontecer como consequência o reforço para esse primeiro comportamento com menor probabilidade para acontecer. Por exemplo, se eu tenho menor probabilidade de beber e maior probabilidade de comer, então eu uso o comportamento de comer para que o comportamento de beber aconteça. But now, if you change deprivation so that the probability of eating is low and the probability of drinking is high, given you have the choice, now you can use the opportunity to drink to reinforce eating. Mas se você cria aí uma condição de privação de, de, de água, por exemplo, aí você altera essas condições. E o comportamento de beber se torna mais provável do que o comportamento de comer. So you no longer can think about Uh, certain kinds of things always being reinforcers, other kinds of things always being aversive. It's all relative, and you think instead in terms of the probabilities of the different responses involved in these contingencies. You make it more and more of a behavioral uh, uh, criterion. A partir daí você para de olhar para as para para as para as condições como especificamente reforço, espe especificamente uh, punição, por exemplo porque se torna relativo de acordo com a, a condição, com a situação. E aí você torna, ou, você pode olhar para essa, essa situação a partir de uma perspectiva comportamental, que relativiza a, o valor da, de determinado produto. 
In the meantime, the, the people coming along were changing. Uh, there were different groups of people, for example, who came through Harvard. Earlier on, there had been Bill Morris and Dick Kernstein and uh, uh, Nate Azrin and, and others. And, and I'm not going to try to continue that list at great length because it's so easy to leave people out that shouldn't be left out. I came along there with uh, people like uh, George Reynolds and, uh, uh, and, uh, um, and a few others. And then, uh, uh, then what happened was Skinner decided to move on from uh, maintaining the Pigeon Lab like the one I'm in right now, uh, which used this old electromechanical equipment. But Skinner had been doing research for a long time and he wasn't in the lab very much. He was traveling a lot. Skinner closed the Pigeon Lab down. Uh, Dick Hernstein became the person doing most of the behavioral things. The department moved from its original home in Memorial Hall to William James Hall. And the, the, the character of the research also changed. But uh, among, among the students of Dick Hernstein were Billy Baum and Ed Fantino and Phil Heinlein and Alan Nuringer and Howie Racklin and again, others. Um, so, uh, and these, these people all began doing their different kinds of things. And I, again, I cannot get into the details. Otherwise we won't even get through the 1960s this evening. Uh, meantime, we were beginning to think of, because of the relativity of reinforcement and pre, pre Max uh, contributions, we were beginning to think about contingencies in terms of conditional probabilities. The, what is the probability that something will happen given that a response occurred? And what, it's, what is its probability given the response has not occurred? It began to be a new way of thinking about things. We didn't think about pairings anymore. It's not like the old Pavlovian way that you pair this with that. And then even Pavlovian stuff was thought about in terms of conditional probabilities. What is the probability of the conditional stimulus, uh, 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 or the the, un, the conditional stimulus? I'm sorry. What is the probability of the unconditional stimulus given the condi conditional stimulus, and what it's, what is its probability without the conditional stimulus? And you can only make sense in terms of those different uh, things in terms of those different probabilities. Um. E depois o Skinner, na verdade, começa a vir uma nova ninhada de alunos para Harvard. O Skinner muda de... de, de ele, ele deixa de manter o laboratório de, de, de pombos e o, o, o laboratório, na verdade, acaba mudando, saindo do, do Memorial, Memorial Hall, que era onde ele estava, vai para o William James Hall, que é um novo prédio que eles constroem na Harvard. É, esse tanto de pessoas que tá aí o nome é, Baum, Fantino, Heinlein passam pela Harvard, cada um começa a trabalhar no seu próprio projeto e aí vem um novo movimento enfatizando essa probabilidade das contingências ou as contingências como a probabilidade condicional em que é, e, e aquela, aquela simples questão do pareamento uh, pavloviano, ela deixa de ser olhada bruta e aí começa a se aplicar essa questão da, da condicionalidade para as contingências. Okay, the other uh, the other things there were other things. I mean, there was a thing called Project Follow Through, which was a a, a, a national experiment in education in the United States, in which various approaches to education were compared with each other, and probably the biggest educational control experiment in the history, at least of this country, the United States. Uh, and the behavior analysis programs actually did very, very well in that study, but they were covered up by politics because each of the contributors was allowed to, uh, uh, to say what its values were. So if the values were that you've got to teach uh, um, uh, uh, social skills, whether you taught the kids math didn't matter. Um, And the behavior analysis programs then were the ones that were most successful in actually teaching subject stuff, not uh, and and not in reaching these other kinds of uh, socially defined criteria. But for that reason, the investment was not put into education. So it's one of those cases where prejudices about behavior and the control of behavior influenced national educational policies. Naquela época também teve um projeto muito famoso nos Estados Unidos sobre educação, que foi chamado desse projeto, projeto Follow Through, uh, que várias, várias disciplinas aplicaram seus conhecimentos para a educação. 
E, na verdade, a análise de comportamento de, se deu muito bem nesse projeto, mas ela se deu melhor não ensinando habilidades sociais ou coisas dentro desse, desse grupo, mas ensinando habilidades uh, de, de, de matérias escolares mesmo. Uh, só que se uma disciplina ela estava cotada para ensinar algo social e ela desenvolvia outros repertórios que não se encaixavam dentro desse grupo, é, acabava não sendo contabilizado. Então, ah. aí, aí, aí ficou a, a análise de comportamento ainda continuou com muito preconceito, justamente por conta desse negócio de controle de comportamento, etc., apesar de ter, de ter dado, uh, de ter tido um bom desempenho nesse projeto. And then the field was also bringing things in from outside. So, for example, the field of signal detection took a different kind of look at sensor uh, relations between stimuli and responses. In signal detection, you ask, what is the probability of a response given a signal and, uh, and what is the probability of, of not getting a response versus what are those probabilities with no signal? If you look at things that way, uh, you can start to analyze effects of stimuli in, in quantitative ways in which you can start talking about sensitivity to stimuli. An example uh, that involves some applications that came out of behavior analysis was in studying breast exa self-examination, in which uh, you want, if you're doing that kind of an examination, to detect uh, a potentially malignant node if there is one there, and there's a cost for missing it, but also you don't want to say there's one there if there isn't one there, and there's a cost for saying that there's something there when there isn't. So you have correct detections and correct rejections, but you also have hits and misses, and they all have their separate costs, and we can, we can analyze any discrimination situation in those terms. Uh, aí também começa a surgir, ou começa a vir conceitos de outras disciplinas, como detecção de sinal, onde olha-se para a probabilidade de um comportamento ocorrer dado um sinal, ou a probabilidade desse comportamento não ocorrer, ou de, de não acontecer essa resposta. E aí pode-se começar a falar sobre a sensitividade ou sensibilidade do estímulo. E aí ele deu um exemplo de exame de detecção de nódulo nas mamas. É, existe um custo alto de dizer que existe um nódulo maligno no seio quando, na verdade, ele não existe. Mas também existe um custo de dizer que ele não está lá quando, na verdade, ele está. Yeah. Okay, so, by the way, time seems to go by faster as you get older. So, as we get through the coming decades, we'll find that things move faster. Um, okay, uh, the, then there were other applications. Is Israel Gold Diamond had been doing basic work, including uh, things that are very much like signal detection work. But he studied stuttering and contingencies that affected stuttering. Um, then there was this procedure called timeout. And nowadays, if you want to think of anything that exists in contemporary culture that comes out of behavior analysis that everybody knows about, uh, you'll hear people say, well, if that keep, keeps on going, I'm going to put, put you in timeout. Uh, people recognize that as an aversive procedure, and it is not necessarily well And, and actually, maybe it's a good thing that many people don't know that it started in behavior analysis. E aí surge também com o estudo do Gold, o Gold Diamond, estudando com, com, com gadeira, sobre gadeira, e a, o, o procedimento de timeout, que hoje é visto por muitos como, como um procedimento aversivo. E, então, na verdade, é até bom que as pessoas não... A, pelo menos dessa vez, não relacionam muito o timeout com a análise de comportamento a partir de estar relacionado, a partir de ter surgido dentro desse contexto. And, and it's often misused in the culture. Um, é. E a cultura uh, geralmente usa de forma errada. So just in case there are people who don't know it, timeout was originally uh, a substitute for aversive events like electric shock. Instead of delivering electric shock, you deliver a period of time in which the chamber goes dark And the pigeon can no longer work for food. Uh, então, so you time put out, the pigeon so... into timeout. 
só para definir, é, o timeout é um, é um período, então, por exemplo, pensa no, no pombo dentro da caixa experimental, ao invés de dar choque no pombo, é, o timeout é um, um período de luz apagada é, em que o pombo não pode trabalhar para obter comida. Então, ele é impedido de, 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 de se comportar para ter a consequência que, tá, que era aprendido. And people began to use it then in education, but the problem was it was an aversive event. It was used to punish behavior. And that had unfortunate consequences um, that, that um, uh, uh, and so it was used with kids. And, and so in education, it was often used not to teach the kid anything, but mainly to make things easier for the teacher by managing kids who were too active And so it was classroom management, not, not education. It was just keeping the class orderly. E no, na educação, o timeout começou a ser usado não no intuito de ensinar comportamentos, mas no intuito de, de lidar com o comportamento ruim dos alunos na sala. Uh, e não como ensino, ensino de, de novos comportamentos. If you're doing well educating with reinforcers, you shouldn't need, to, uh, need any aversive events like timeout. Se você está ensinando e, e lidando de uma forma positiva com o esquema de reforçamento, você não precisa de procedimentos de timeout. Now, related to this was the work of Ivar Lovas, who was also who was working with autistic children, but who used a lot of aversive stuff along with reinforcement. And this became uh, the subject of uh, magazine articles and people who were critical about the ethical implications. And Lovas called what he did applied behavior analysis. O Lovas surge nesse contexto trabalhando com o autismo e misturando junto com o sistema de reforçamento punição. Isso levanta uma grande controvérsia na época, levando um monte de, 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 de pessoas na mídia, inclusive, publicarem artigos contra ou falando do procedimento. E o Lovas chamou isso que ele fazia na época de análise de comportamento. And that, that remains as a problem for us, or at least here in the United States, because uh, even just a few years ago, I met somebody in a, in a group here in Columbia, Maryland, uh, who, uh, uh, and, I, and she was asking me what I did, and I said, well, I'm a behavior analyst, and, and some people do it, perhaps you've heard of applied behavior analysis. Um, and she got very upset because she, she had an adult Uh, son on the autism spectrum who had gotten Lovas treatment and her understanding was it involved all this aversive stuff and, and this, this kid was still having problems. And I had to then go through a lot of time to explain that what we do now is very different from the approach Lovas had taken. E isso gerou uma, uma fama muito negativa da análise do comportamento, pelo menos aqui nos Estados Unidos. Recentemente o Charlie encontrou uma mulher Uh, em uma situação específica e a mulher perguntou para ele o que, que ele fazia. Ele disse, eu sou um analista de comportamento. Ah, aí a mulher ficou muito, na verdade, ela expressou a indignação dela, porque o filho dela, com o autismo, é, tinha sido submetido a esse procedimento do Lovas, e, e, que envolvia muita punição, e estava tendo consequências até, até o momento da conversa. E aí, então, o Charlie teve que explicar para ela e mostrar que, na verdade, a gente não trabalha assim, que as coisas são diferentes. Ah, uh, you remember, you remember last time we briefly mentioned that uh, Noam Chomsky had written a very critical review of Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior. Um, and uh, it was filled with what we would today call fake news. At least in the 60s, there was some, beginning to be some reply to that. But the problem was that it couldn't be published in places where the appropriate audience would get it. Um, uh, Kenneth McCorkdale replied to Chomsky in a very thorough way, but the only place we had to publish it was in the Journal of the Experimental Analysis of Behavior. E lembra que a gente falou um pouco sobre, sobre a crítica do Chomsky ao, 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 ao livro Comportamento Verbal do Skinner? E na década de 60, o McCorkdale escreve um, uma resposta a essa crítica do Chomsky ao, a, ao comportamento verbal, mas o problema é que essa crítica não foi publicada em, em periódicos que teriam alcance da população que precisaria ler. 
e foi foi publicada no Geab. Um, and then there were other controversies because the assumption was made that just because we talk about reinforcement and changing behavior through shaping, that we're making the argument that all changes in behavior and all behavior depends on reinforcement, which is certainly not true. But people who found cases in which other kinds of things were going on in behavior, having to do with um, certain kinds of responses that become highly probable in aversive situations and so forth, thought they had arguments against a behavior analytic approach because they made the assumption that we'd never talk about evolved behavior, we'd never talk about evolutionary things, when in fact that was always at the heart of what we did. Uh, outras contradições vinham a partir de, de situações específicas que algumas pessoas encontravam, uh, em que elas, elas diziam, olha, na verdade não são todos os comportamentos que são, uh, que são sensíveis às consequências, ou às consequências de reforçar, às contingências de reforçamento. E eles usavam esse tipo de coisa é, para, por exemplo, dizer algumas coisas são evolutivas, os comportamentos sim, é, evoluem. E eles usavam essas coisas para trazer descrédito à análise do comportamento, quando, na verdade, isso estava já no, 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 no coração da análise do comportamento. Now, you recall when I talked about superstition, I talked about the problem of uh, uh, behavior continuing even though Uh, it was only accidentally followed by reinforcers. And I want to kind of skip one slide here and go to this one. Um, I, I learned about the, this particular distinction, especially because uh, in, uh, in, in my later time at UMBC, when I became involved in the Applied Behavior Analysis Program, I was talking to people there about the use of extinction in uh, treatment programs for kids with developmental disabilities. Um, lembro quando eu estava falando sobre superstição e falando sobre como um determinado comportamento é, ele tem uma consequência, mas na verdade é, é, uma, é, uma, é uma coincidência que a consequência tenha, que aquilo tenha acontecido depois daquele comportamento, quando na verdade aquele comportamento não causou aquela consequência. Na, uh, na universidade, quando o Charlie começou a se envolver com o um programa de análise aplicada do comportamento para crianças com, com transtornos do desenvolvimento, ele foi falar então sobre essa questão de reforçamento e extinção. And I was writing about these kinds of things for my learning book, and my colleague at UMBC, Elliot Shimoff, was saying, well, Charlie, why instead of using the pigeon and the rat data, why don't you show some human data on extinction? E eu estava falando com um colega meu na UNBC, naquela época ele disse assim, Charlie, por que, que ao invés de você mostrar dados em ratos e pombos, você não mostra dados em humanos? And I started looking in Java and I couldn't find any. Aí eu comecei a olhar no Java any, e eu não consegui encontrar nenhum. Any, any good examples? For the, and it turns out, started talking to uh, Willie to Leon and others, and they say, well, we, don't, we hardly ever use extinction, we mainly use free reinforcers. E eu não consegui achar, pelo menos, nenhum exemplo bom de extinção. E aí, conversando com algumas pessoas, eles disseram, a gente não usa extinção, a gente usa principalmente reforço. Reforçamento. So let's look at, let's look at some uh, comparison here. Supposing we have three groups of rats. Então, vamos olhar alguns exemplos. Suponha que a gente tem três grupos de ratos. First group, we go from reinforcement to reinforcement. Primeiro grupo, a gente vai de reforçamento para reforçamento. We have responses down here, and the little arrows are reinforcers. So, of course, the, the rat is pressing the lever and pressing the lever, and once in a while, food comes and it eats, and it's a happy rat. And as reinforcement continues, it's still a happy rat. Então, ali, aqueles tra os tracinhos em cima da linha... Uh, horizontal, da primeira linha horizontal são as respostas e as setinhas embaixo são os, os reforços, né? Uh, ou as, a comidinha. Então o rato tá lá apertando, apertando a barra e ele ganha uh, a consequência. É, ele é um rato feliz, né? Então ele tem reforço e reforço, ele é um rato feliz ao longo de todo o processo. So I assume emojis are a universal language, right? They are, Charlie. Okay. So now let's look at what happens in extinction. 
In extinction, the, we break the contingency between the response and the reinforcer. So in this middle graph, we see that here the reinforcers stop. And, segundo, and responding also slows down because it's no longer maintained by the contingency. No segundo exemplo, a gente tem reforçamento, as respostas então acontecendo e sendo reforçadas e um rato feliz. E quando a gente institui a, a, a extinção, a gente tem as respostas que vão diminuindo de frequência porque não existe consequência, não existe reforço para o comportamento. But now if we look and, and, and... But so we have a rat who's eating, and then after we begin extinction, it's not eating anymore, and this is a hungry rat, and this is now no longer a happy rat. Uh, durante a, a, o reforçamento, a gente tem um rato que está se comportando e está tá sendo alimentado. Então, a gente tem um rato feliz. Mas quando a gente institui a extinção, ele está se comportando, vai diminuindo, e ele não tem, ele não está se alimentando. Aí, então, ele fica um rato brabo. Now, in this bottom graph, What we do is we continue the reinforcers. Note the arrows down here are the same, occurring at the same rate as they occurred for the rat in the first group, but the contingency is broken. The reinforcers come without regard to what the animal is doing. No terceiro caso, a gente tem um caso de reforçamento e de, de, de reforçamento que não é ligado à contingência. É, a, as consequências, elas não são dadas de acordo com as respostas do rato. Elas estão sendo dadas ali, da mesma forma que elas são dadas em cima, mas elas são dadas de maneira livre, não contingentes à resposta. So, we broke the contingency, responding decreases, but the food's still coming, so we still have a happy rat. Nós quebramos a contingência no, segundo, no, no último caso, mas a consequência ainda vem. E, e como a consequência continua vindo, a gente tem um rato feliz. Earlier, people didn't want to do this because they, was, they were afraid that the free reinforcers would create superstitions. E no começo as pessoas não queriam fazer isso porque elas achavam, elas tinham medo que reforçamentos livres, ou re, essas consequências de reforçadoras livres, iam criar superstição. Mas we we now know that we don't have to worry about that. So, both of these, the second and the third frames here, show what happens when you break the contingency. In both cases, responding goes away. So, responding is maintained by the contingency. In only one case, do you have an unhappy rat, and that's a side effect you can avoid by making sure you don't take the reinforcers away. E hoje a gente sabe que esse não é mais o caso, né? Uh, de, 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 de reforçar não contingente e criar comportamento de superstição. No segundo e no terceiro caso, então, a gente tem exemplos de comportamentos que... Exemplos de situações em que a contingência é quebrada, ou seja, o responder não, não produz mais a consequência, a resposta diminui de frequência nos dois casos, mas se você continua liberando o reforço livre, você tem um rato feliz no último caso, e um, ao invés de ter um rato bravo, que seria o caso da extinção. The, the message that lots of people got from taking just an elementary, an introductory course in psychology was, if you see behavior you don't like, extinguish it. E o que as pessoas viam na, na, no, no primeiro ano da graduação em psicologia era, se você vê comportamentos que você não gosta, coloque esses comportamentos em extinção, crie essa condição de extinção para os comportamentos. And if that behavior is the kid throwing a tantrum at the checkout counter in a supermarket, you were supposed to try to extinguish that in spite of the fact that these terrible things were happening in front of everybody else in the store. E aí se o comportamento, por exemplo, é uma birra que o seu filho faz no caixa do mercado, porque ele quer alguma coisa, é, você teria que, na verdade, né, ignorar lá e não reforçar o comportamento e deixar a criança fazendo a birra. They've got to be big reinforcers if they can create behavior like that, so why take them away? Find a way to use them constructively. Uh, sorry, Charlie, could you repeat that? They, they are big reinforcers, so why take them away? 
find a way to use those reinforcers constructively. Esses, esses, esses reforçamentos, eles são, são grandes, são poderosos. Então, uh, por que, por que eliminá-los? Encontre um jeito de fazer com que eles funcionem da melhor forma. Ok, e then I accidentally discovered <coughs> that I own an Azrin back in 1965 did the experiment that I could have used in my text. Because here's an experiment that they did involving uh, um, token reinforcers in the psychiatric ward. They had reinforcers contingent upon performance and then they did extinction and they got a decrease in that particular behavior. I don't remember right now what the details of the behavior were. And then they brought the contingent reinforcement back and the behavior came back. But in the second condition, another uh, a comparable group, they went from reinforcers that contingent upon performance to non-contingent reinforcers, like what kept that rat happy. And the behavior decreased in that situation. Just in fact, if anything, it decreased even more. And then the behavior came back. So non-contingent reinforcement did have the kinds of behavioral effects we'd like to see. And uh, so this is the article in which that figure appeared. I should have found it. I was looking in Java. I never looked in JAB. Aí, acidentalmente, eu encontrei esse artigo. Would you mind just putting the previous one back, Charlie? D during, the, uh, Charlie. during these years, by the way, we also had the questions, do you reinforce the organism or do you reinforce the response? Charlie, we sorry. It's important to talk. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. No, would you just mind going back to the previous slide? Oh, sure. That one, sorry, sorry. E aí, por acidente, ele encontrou esse artigo do Ilon e do Asen uh, no GEAB de 1965. Esse artigo, na verdade, ele não encontrou porque esse era um artigo que tradicionalmente estaria no Java, mas mostrando mais uma vez que no começo não tinha bem essa divisão de experimental e aplicada. E esse artigo eles fizeram com, 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 com pacientes é, no hospital psiquiátrico e, e eles perceberam exatamente aquele mesmo efeito. Então, as respostas é, reforçadas, elas eram em maior quantidade. Uh, e eles tiveram um grupo em que eles aplicaram extinção uh, pura e um grupo onde o, o, o que continua recebendo uh, reforçamento, mas não contingente. E aí eles perceberam que nos dois casos teve uma queda na, na quantidade de comportamentos, na frequência dos comportamentos, eu não lembro especificamente qual comportamento que era medido, e depois esses comportamentos retornaram quando a contingência foi instaurada de novo. Esse é o artigo do Ilan e do Asen de 1965. Better and better in talking about things. We got better in our ways of talking. So we talked about reinforcing responses, not organisms. If you can talk about reinforcing an organism, then you can leave out the response. Uh, but if you talk about reinforcing responses, you have to say, you can always say wh who's, which response it is. Um, and our language of stimulus control got better. I don't think we can take the time for the detail here because it's fairly technical. Uh, but these things were happening. We were getting better and better at the way we talked about behavior. And so there was another important event during that decade. And you folks may be especially interested. Fred Keller went to Brazil. He was asked to teach at the University of Brasilia when it was being established. And uh, that was the beginning of, you might not be here if it wasn't for Fred doing that, right? Yeah, and uh, so I, uh, I last time I showed this briefly and mentioned that if anybody who's watching this knows the names of the people in this picture, so I, we I put that please on send them to Meron and and we will try to compile a thing in which we can identify. As Charlie, so we did have that. some people who who wrote some things. We do great. So I really like. Somebody that. says that uh, Carolina Bori is on body. Uh, mm -hmm. is, is in the first line. Ah, uh, good. That Carolina was, that, that was the there. one thing people said. So we had a couple of people saying Carolina Body. Okay. Is there? Well, that's Is there, right? I think so, but yeah. Um, I, I, I only met her once or twice um, over the years. 
but uh, um, so the, so the, the field was beginning to become international. Um, this also is a Skinner. Skinner was invited to um, to Russia during the '60s, and he spent his time there and sent the letter back. This is the Sputnik stamp that was important at the time, uh, and uh, and he signed the book in uh, in uh, Pavlov's apartments of uh, visiting uh -huh. scholars. So I saw his name in that book. Uh, and but now let's get back. We we've got to talk about the field. We got to get it. That th I put this together because. If you look at, at the people on, uh, whose names are listed here, almost all of them are known for basic research, but look at the applications. I own an Azrin. Not only is Azrin doing punishment stuff, he does token economies. B. Barrett is working and visiting the Pigeon Lab, talking about schedules of reinforcement during this decade, but she's working on procedures for reducing ticks, you know, the little kind of movements like in Tourette's syndrome. She's also working in education. Bijou and Bear and all those colleagues, the people who were involved in the foundings of Java, they're working on child development and disabilities. Joe Brady is doing basic research in psychopharmacology, but he's also training the chimps that will be sent up in the first satellites before we send up humans, and we brought them back alive, uh, unlike the dogs that were sent up by the Russians. Peter Dews is, is, used, is doing basic research, but is also creating psychopharmacology. Not only is Charlie First doing schedules of reinforcement, but he's also working on uh, uh, autism. That's what psych, they would call psychotic children then. And he comes up with the behavioral theory of depression. Is Gold Diamond has done lots of basic stuff, but he also works on stuttering. Jim Holland is doing schedules work on observing behavior, looking at things, but he's also doing human vigilance how do you, can you use schedules of reinforcement for people who have to look at radar screens to detect targets coming up on the radar screens? Fred Keller has done his basic work, but he's doing personalized system of instruction, which he, he really refines once he's teaching in Brazil. Og Lindsley is working with psychiatric patients while he's also getting uh, um, uh, uh, the um, uh, charting and so forth, uh, the acceleration charts. Skinner is doing lots of, is, is, is more interested in teaching machines than he is in schedules during this time period. Uh, uh, Charlie Schuster and uh, Travis Thompson are doing the beginnings of work on drug self-administration using the delivery of, the intravenous delivery of drugs as a reinforcer. Uh, Tom Brahav is using pigeons to do quality control experiments. These are all the things that nobody thought about as being separate fields. This was one group of people doing one thing, which was behavior analysis. Interesting. Uh, and if, to get an idea of how things were growing in those days, these are three different books that came out and during that time period uh, as a series, which included reprints of applied work. These are three, 400 page books with dozens of articles in them of applied work carried on during that time. And these are other books that include collections of papers on applied research back in those days. It was just an explosion of stuff. É, o interessante dessa época, em todos aqueles, aqueles autores ali que ele colocou antes, eram, eram autores que trabalhavam, tinham todo uma, uma, um histórico de, de trabalho com pesquisa experimental, mas ao mesmo tempo estavam fazendo também pesquisa aplicada. Então não tinha essa divisão como se fossem dois campos separados. Era análise do comportamento como um todo que estava ficando, que estava se tornando um, uma ciência internacional. Então antes ele mostrou ali a foto uh, do, do Fred Keller no Brasil, com, com aquelas várias pessoas do Brasil, mostrou a, a foto de quando Skinner tinha ido para a Rússia uh, para falar sobre análise de comportamento e mandou ali um, um cartão postal para ele. Uh, mas e, e aí esses livros que começam a, a ser impressos, cada livro de 400, 500 páginas, com, com coletâneas da, do, dos artigos experimentais e artigos dos artigos aplicados. 
So let's, we're moving forward by a decade. We may need to have to schedule another one of these. I don't mind, Charlie. But, but let's look at the 1970s, okay? Everything is getting more and more complicated all, all the time. Uh, there's something here, this, this is the, can this be moved? I think it can, so I can see what's. Uh, oh, sorry. Oops. Oh, okay. Uh, international stuff is getting complicated. This is the Yom Kippur War, right? But it's, yeah. anyway. Computer languages are beginning to be developed, and uh, and at this point we begin to get PCs and people who can now run spreadsheets and word word processors. Yeah, we wanted this one uh, moved oh, along right. here. Yes. There it is. Sorry. Okay. Uh, there's the Yom Kippur War in '73. The World Trade Center is built in 1973. Uh, we have the political crisis in the United States, in which Nixon does Watergate. He tries to do political stuff by actually having burglars break into Watergate. It ends up with his resignation in 1974. We can wish for parallel things that could happen in more contemporary times. In both America and Brazil. And Brazil. I know, Bolsonaro. But at least he sometimes wears a mask. No, he, he was just told by like a judge yeah, just but, sign. but apparently he, he has shown up at events with masks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once in a while. Yeah, yeah, when he's telling people to invade hospitals, he does. That. I understand. I understand. <laughs> it's okay. I, um, we, 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 we have similar views. Yeah. Uh, the Viet, but at least the Vietnam War is finally ending. But as a result of the Vietnam War, we have the Khmer Rouge, the genocide in Cam Cambodia. There's an attempt to resolve the problems uh, between um, Israel and, uh, and the surrounding Islamic states with the Camp David Accords. They do not, uh, they have a temporary effects. In that time, the Ayatollah Khomeini brings the Islamic revolution to Iran and they invade the uh, American embassy and they hold hostages. And then by the end of that decade, uh, the Russia invades Afghanistan. This is all happening in the 70s. We continued what we did. We continued to work on behavior analysis. We have to, in spite of the crazy things that are going on in the world around us, we have to keep doing our work. Esse tanto de coisa que está acontecendo na década de 70, que vocês, vocês viram aí, uh, são coisas que, que, na verdade, não pararam os analistas do comportamento. A análise do comportamento continua trabalhando ao longo de todo esse período. Oh, Sorry, I think, it got, okay. like, I think when we uploaded, that may have shifted. Yeah, oh, I see, and the shift from the, there's something that's very big in here that's, uh, well, anyway. Sorry, okay. Charlie. Well, let's try to do this anyway. So, but, but in the meantime, what's happening in behavior analysis? Um, there's, uh, there's already an organization called the Midwest Association for Behavior Analysis that was kind of anchored at Western Michigan University. And it had a couple of meetings, mostly in Chicago at a hotel there. Um, and there was a time at which Nate Azrin was the president of the Midwest Psychological Association. And in the same year, he was the president of the Midwest Association for Behavior Analysis. And they were meeting in two hotels close to each other. And he had to run back and forth between the two hotels to be the officer for both of those organizations. O Asrin, nessa década de 60, quando ele era ele era o presidente da Associação Centro-Oeste do Midwest aqui dos Estados Unidos em análise de comportamento, mas também do, do presidente da Associação Midwest de Psicologia, e, no mesmo ano. E, e, e existia um congresso acontecendo das duas associações no mesmo ano, no mesmo lugar, Uh, em hotéis próximos, então ele ficou, o Ashen ficou correndo de um hotel para o outro para poder para poder participar dos dois dos dois congressos. So that was in 74, um, and uh, it, it was just a couple of years. I missed that first meeting, otherwise I could have, for a while there, I was going to all of those meetings, but, uh, but um, uh, pretty soon it became the Association for Behavior Analysis and then the Association for Behavior Analysis International. And of course, uh, other folks there know about that organization. In the meantime, in the, in the field, 
uh, Dick Kernstein began moving from experimental analysis to quantitative analysis. He came up with this thing he called the matching law. It was mainly looking at not so much doing experiments as in finding mathematical ways of describing uh, behavior. O Hernstein começa, vai movendo, vai mudando aí de análise experimental para uma análise quantitativa a partir da lei da, de, de matching, de correspondência. Uh, uh, então, people began doing what was called discrete trial instruction. Willard Day at the University of Nevada in Reno founded the journal Behaviorism in 1972. Sidman begins to do research on what he came to call equivalence classes. Um, I don't know whether he, okay, the year isn't in there. Uh, Nate Azrin and, and Richard Fox began, uh, published a little book on toilet training. Uh, toilet training in less than a day. It became a very big seller, probably still the biggest selling book in an application of behavior analysis. Um, uh, I, I will just in passing, Julian Jaynes wrote a book called The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. The reason I put it in this list is because he proposes that human language is very recent. And that I think was an important innovation. Scott Wood became the first editor of the journal that was founded for, uh, 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 for the Association for Behavior Analysis. It was called the Behavior Analyst. Uh, and then the Society for the Quantitative Analysis of Behavior was, uh, was founded by, uh, um, uh, by uh, oh, I forgot, I'm forgetting his first name, but uh, uh, Commons and Nevin. Uh, they created that organization, which essentially I think of as a separate development that is not part of the experimental analysis of behavior. And what I'm doing here is I'm not going to try to follow all of the separate lines of people who develop different things and went off to, to come up with their separate groups. I want to follow the main line of the experimental analysis of behavior and its extensions to applied behavior analysis. Aí, na década de 70, começa a existir todos esses movimentos, mas o foco aqui não vai ser acompanhar cada uma dessas linhas que vão surgindo a partir daí, uh, mas sim de acompanhar, de, de seguir a linha da, da análise experimental clássica. Ok, e aí, a outra coisa que estava acontecendo nesses anos foi the beginnings of uh, organizational behavior management. Uh, Tom Gilbert published a book called Human Comp Competence, trying to apply behavioral principles to business. They were the early uses in just a few businesses, uh, behavioral uh, um, uh, procedures. Aubrey Daniels, uh, who um, and now is much involved in the Cambridge Center for Behavior Analysis, began doing uh, behavioral things and, and, and consulting with organizations in those days. All of this stuff involves both uh, developments in uh, basic research and in applications. Um, é, to todas essas áreas aí uh, representam desenvolvimentos tanto da aplicada como da experimental. So this is, uh, this is uh, just uh, uh, a special issue of uh, JAB was created for Skinner. Uh, around 1970. This is a picture of a dinner. I think folks will recognize that's Fred Keller, that's Skinner there, that's Charlie Furster, uh, that's me. That's my wife Connie too. Is that, that's not Schoenfeld, that's Eve Skinner. Uh, that was held uh, in Cambridge uh, at, at Harvard and uh, was a, a, a memorable event. Um, uh, um Skinner, Skinner and, and Keller often kidded each other. Oh, okay, go ahead. Wait, wait. Yeah. Foi um jantar comemorativo para o Skinner que aconteceu aqui na Harvard. E aí tinha pessoas como Fred Keller, o, o Charles Catania, a esposa dele, Connie, estava ali também na foto, o Ferster. Uh, yeah. Okay, and this is, this is just a picture I like because the label for it is Keller saying to Skinner, I just saw something move in your dessert. Is that real? Is that for real? I don't know. I don't know, but that's that's how it's been labeled. And I think I've always loved it. Lost this photo because he fala é é o Keller dizendo para o Skinner. Acabei de ver uma coisa mexendo aí no seu prato, nessa comida. Yeah. 
Uh, and this is Fred Keller and Jack Michael. Jack was really important in many ways. He helped uh, uh, Fred Keller get a job after he returned from Brazil uh, for a while at Western Michigan and so forth. And uh, because uh, Fred Keller's retirement back in those days did not have the kind of support that university retirements then had later. And this is also Scott Wood, who was the first editor of the Behavior Analyst. Um, Scott was later at uh, um, Ah, um, the name will come to me, but uh, I'm trying to remember the university he was at. When you get older, you tend to forget things from time to time. Okay. Think, but, um, but, uh, oh, Drake College. He was at Drake, Drake, Drake in uh, Drake University. So anyway, um, so, just, so just, just but meantime, it. during, go ahead. Do you want to say a little more? Yeah, just, just, just about Jack Michael and Fred Taylor. Ah, uh, naquela foto anterior estava o Jack Michael e o Fred Keller. O Jack Michael ele ele deu todo um suporte para o Fred Keller quando ele voltou do Brasil, quando ele voltou daí do Brasil aqui para os Estados Unidos. Uh, ele não tinha o suporte de aposentadoria que que, que as coisas que, que existe hoje. E o Jack Michael ajudou o Fred Keller a conseguir o um emprego. E o Scott que estava na foto do lado, ele foi o primeiro editor do do, do, do journal, the journal, the behavior analyst. And in the meantime, although I have told the story as if all these great things are happening, the other thing was that behavior analysis was being challenged on many different fronts. E se, se todas essas coisas estavam acontecendo, coisas positivas, tinha muito muito desafio acontecendo também com a análise de comportamento estava experimentando muito desafio. Examples. Uh, Ron Hutchinson had worked with Nate Azrin on aversive events. One of the things he demonstrated that was incredibly important was that if you ex have an animal uh, in an aversive situation, you increase the probability that it will attack other animals nearby. Uma das coisas que o Hutchinson mostrou é que se você tem um, um animal em uma situação aversiva, Isso aumenta muito a probabilidade desse animal atacar outros animais que estiverem perto dele. You think it would be obvious that studying something like that is important because if you have people living in terrible po poverty and all sorts of other aversive conditions, there may be more violence around than if you make their world better. E a gente imagina que é óbvio a, a importância de se estudar isso porque se você tem pessoas vivendo em, em extrema situação de aversiva, de pobreza, cheio, cheio de, de questões aversivas, a tendência é que aumenta a violência. But Proxot Meyer, who was a Republican senator in the, in the U.S. Congress, made fun of National Science Foundation grants, and he awarded those he thought were especially outrageous with what he called the Golden Fleece Award. E aí o Proxot Meyer, que era um senador republicano na época, Ele criou, fez uma sátira e criou um prêmio como se fosse o, o algodão de ouro. Uh, Hutchinson uh, actually uh, ended up having to stop his line of research. He sued and, and got some recovery of things, but he ended up uh, not being able to pursue that. Uh, Meanwhile, Chomsky had already done his stuff on verbal behavior, his criticism of Skinner. He also, when Skinner wrote his book, Beyond Freedom of Dignity, Chomsky uh, came out and criticized Skinner as a fascist, called Skinner a fascist. Lepper and Green were two social psychologists who started doing these experiments on what they called the hidden costs of reward, which were things like give the kid gold stars for doing something like finger painting and then take the gold stars away. And now they start finger painting less than they would have if they'd never gotten the gold stars. Not an important phenomenon, it turns out, very uh, unstable, but they began to, they were the ones who began these arguments that reinforcement is a bad thing to use in the classroom. Nessa época surge, além de do Hutchinson, então ter parado a sua pesquisa por conta dessa 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 questão do Proxmire, ele ele para com a pesquisa, ele processa, ele acaba tendo um pouco de, de, de 
recupera algumas coisas, mas ele acaba não conseguindo continuar a pesquisa. O Chomsky critica o Skinner como fascista, e aí surgem, surgem movimentos de Lepper Green, por exemplo, dizendo que mostrando ou, ou dizendo que se você usa reforçamento, esquemas de reforçamento, depois que você tira o reforço, esses comportamentos vão baixar para níveis inferiores ao que eles seriam se eles nunca tivessem sido reforçados. E aí começa a crítica, grande crítica, a, ou continua, mas é uma grande crítica aos, aos esquemas de reforçamento. Then there was Hal Weiner, who is a, a basic researcher, and he started working with people, and he found that schedules didn't work. And because he didn't find the schedules working for humans, instead of trying to figure out why that was the case, which we now know is because of human verbal behavior, he decided to say that the whole behavioral behavior analysis enterprise was flawed and suggested it should be closed down. Weiner, ele, ele começa a aplicar esquemas de reforçamento em humanos, ele não vê os efeitos. E ao invés de, de estudar e procurar entender por que, que eles não funcionavam, hoje a gente sabe que é por conta do comportamento verbal, ele pega e diz, não, na verdade não funciona, e começa uma tentativa aí de fechamento, de fechar a análise do comportamento, de parar com a análise do comportamento. Then there were the arguments over ape intelligence. People, did, did, uh, did chimps have language or not? Which involved the gardeners in Reno and Herb Terrace at Columbia and Dave Premack and Sue Savage Rumbaugh working eventually with Bonobone monkeys. And the, the problems there were that uh, uh, the people didn't really, were doing these things without really having a good understanding of uh, Skinner's analysis as a verbal behavior. Uh, but it became, a, they became, they were turned into, some, some were turned into criticisms of behavior analysis as an approach. Uh, começam controvérsias com relação às inteligências de primatas não humanos. É, se, se existiria uma linguagem ou não. Isso acontece na Universidade de Columbia entre vários, vários pesquisadores diferentes. And then there was Ed Taub, who had been doing work on uh, de-afferented, uh, um, um, on chimpanzees with de-afferented limbs. Oh. E Ed Taub, que estava fazendo pesquisas com, com primatas, com as partes inferiores de-aferentadas. Yeah. Which had relevance to, uh, for human treatment of people who had lost sensation because of, of neurological accidents. E tinha relevância para pesquisa com humanos envolvendo pessoas que perderam a sensibilidade por conta de, de acidentes. There was a group called People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, P-E-T-A, it still exists, by the way. Um, Aí existe, e tinha um grupo nessa época, esse PETA, que era um grupo de, de pessoas uh, com, fazendo um movimento ético pelos animais. They actually Uh, had somebody working in his laboratory who set up some things so that they could accuse him of uneth unethical care of the animals. E pessoas dessa associação infiltraram uh, uma pessoa no laboratório do Ed Taub que fizeram, que criaram toda uma condição, uma, uma, uma situação lá para que ele fosse acusado de procedimentos não éticos no seu laboratório. He had difficulties over a very substantial period of time, but eventually got back into that line of research, but after great many difficulties. Ele, depois de passar por muitas dificuldades durante um período, acabou conseguindo voltar para essa pesquisa, para essa linha de pesquisa. I can't present evidence, but I feel comfortable in talking about this because I've known him over many years, and uh, he was... Uh, uh, When he, when he talked about these sorts of events, um, I, for one, at least believed what he said about the way things went in his laboratories and, and his history. Eu não consigo apresentar evidências disso, mas eu conheci o Ed Taub e, e convivi com ele por muito tempo. E ele sempre falava sobre, sobre, sobre a situação que foi criada nesse, nessa época que ele viveu. So, uh, you may recall that when we talked about Darwin, I talked about the eclipse of Darwinism. Vocês podem se lembrar, quando a gente falou sobre Darwin, a gente falou sobre o eclipse do Darwinismo. 
And in the eclipse of Darwinism, uh, after Darwin died, there was a long period of time when the only genetics that was around was Mendelian genetics. E depois da morte do Darwin, é, por, por, por longo período, uh, quando se falava em genética, não se falava sobre, sobre Darwin. There was no source of the variability that was necessary for evolution to occur by natural selection. Não existia só, a, a, o tipo de variabilidade necessária para acontecer a, a seleção natural. And in the 1890s and the first decades of the 20th century, people said Darwinism was dead. E no final de, do século 19, começo do século 20, as pessoas diziam, o Darwinismo morreu, está morto. But the geneticists who discovered mutation in mutation theory provided the variability that Darwinian selection needed and that began the grand synthesis and the return of, of Darwinian thinking. Mas geneticistas no início do século 20, quando eles descobriram mutação, eles, eles trouxeram aquela condição que faltava para a seleção, uh, aquela condição que faltava para a teoria darwiniana. So, in my career, I have seen from the 50s on all of these declarations that behavior analysis is dead, behaviorism is dead, and all of these attacks throughout, some in the 60s, some in the 70s, and ever since. Uh, e eu, na minha prática, eu vi desde a, da, na década de 50, na década de 60, de 70, as pessoas dizendo análise de comportamento morreu, comportamentalismo morreu. And, but, but we have our applications and they're becoming more and more recognized in Western culture. And I am beginning to think that we are coming out of the eclipse of behavior analysis. Mas a gente tem mostrado as aplicações da nossa ciência mais e mais e eu acredito que a gente esteja saindo desse período de eclipse do behaviorismo. And of course, when the eclipse ends, that makes the future bright. Um, e é que quando o eclipse acaba, o futuro fica mais claro, fica brilhante. So look, we can get to the 80s. E aí a gente chega nos anos 80. Okay, so we have the, I mean, look at, look at what's happening in the world. Um, the, there's the Iran-Iraq war last probably almost the, the whole decade. Uh, when Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Iran and, and the horrible uh, uh, conflict, Britain defeated Argentina in the Falklands, the Marcos regime collapses in the Philippines, the Russians have the Chernobyl disaster. Perhaps because of Chernobyl, uh, Gorbachev initiates perestroika and glasnost in the Soviet U Union. Lech Walesa co-founds the Solidarity Movement in Poland toward the end of the 80s, but Islamic fundamentalists seize the Sudan. There are good things happening. The I was being East born. Hmm? What? I was being born. That's all oh, of that. Okay, okay. that's good too. <laughs> uh, really? That recently? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the, the East Germany takes down, the, or the wall is taken down. Um, and, and then um, in, in, in culture, Dustin Hoffman plays a role as an autistic adult in a movie called The Rain Man, which in the United States begins to get people in general to know something about autism. And so I put that in particularly because there, there of course, there are a lot of other cultural developments in music and art and so forth, but that one seems particularly significant given the thread of autism that runs uh, through that, you know, being able to work with autism, autism uh, some people said became behavior analysis. It was our killer app. Uh, was our uh, a kill, our, killer app, you know, an application that really takes off in, the, in those days. Uh, uh, a computer application was sometimes called uh, that. And some people yeah. referred to our work with autism as, as having that effect. So what happened in the 1980s? 
data analyses, theoretical extensions, there was maximizing and matching, there was generalized matching, amelioration, activation and coupling, there was self-control, procrastination, volition, molar versus molecular theories, behavior extended over time, equivalence, frames, satisficing, optimizing, adduction, reinforcing specificity, reinforcing classes, fluency, discounting, emergent, correspondence, joint attention, joint control, function altering, stimuli, resonance, verbal governance, and the list goes on and on and on, and I am not going to try to explain those. <laughs> they, can, they, can, they can ask their professors to do that. But I mean, really, the field is just exploding with new ideas of various sorts. Some of these have just fallen aside. Others remain important. Um, it's what happens in a science. It gets more and more technical, more and more detailed. And, uh, um, and obviously, I don't feel that this list is complete anyway. That's why there is the little ellipsis of dots here at the end. Um, the applications are growing, and they're getting harder to keep up with. Autism treatment is really beginning to work enough that it's making a difference, that it's beginning to get funding. Uh, there's the expansion of functional analysis. Brian Awada starts doing his functional analysis, which shows that what you've got to do is look not at the topography of the behavior, but you've got to look at how it functions. I'll let you translate that line. Uh, as aplicações começam a acontecer também de uma forma as aplicações do tratamento para autismo começam a decolar e alcançar maior maior impacto. Existe um foco maior em olhar para a função de determinado comportamento e não a topografia desse comportamento ou a forma exterior dele ou a forma como ele acontece, mas a ênfase na, na função. Remember, it started with Skinner and the lever press. Lembra? Começou com o Skinner lá na... Na, na, na barra, na, na barra. Oh my God, it's the, what defined the operant class called lever pressing was the function of the lever press, not what it looked like. E o que definia o, aper, o pressionar a barra, apertar a barra, era a função e não, e não a topografia, não como aquele comportamento aparentava, mas a função dele. A função press a with yeah. right paw, press with left paw, press with both paws, get up and sit on the lever. Bite the lever. All of those are lever presses. Apertar com a pata esquerda, apertar com a pata direita, apertar com as duas patas, levantar, virar, subir em cima da, da, da barra. And what Brian and Wada showed was that the logical extension of that is with respect to the response classes that you see in these difficult treatment situations. E o que mostraram é que a extensão lógica disso Uh, é o que, você acaba vendo isso em, em, quando está lidando com comportamentos problema. The psychiatrists still define behavior problems by topography, by what the responses look like. Os psiquiatras, a, a psiquiatria ainda define comportamentos problema pela topografia, pela forma como eles aparentam ou aparecem. They're looking at form instead of function. Eles estão olhando para forma ao invés de função. But we behavior analysts know that if you see a kid banging his head, I don't want to keep doing that. <laughs> uh, it could be that that has been reinforced. It could be it's a way of avoiding demands. It could be based on maybe something endogenous that uh, that is happening neurologically. Uh, it it. Uh, so, so we can have any one of a variety of different functions, and you do the functional analysis to find out which of those it is for this particular child's behavior. E a gente vê se tem o que o analista do comportamento faz, por exemplo, é ver se tem uma criança batendo a cabeça contra a parede o tempo todo. A, a gente vai tentar olhar para a função daquele comportamento. Às vezes, aquele comportamento pode trazer, pode ter a função de escapar de um de um de um mando. De, ou pode ter alguma coisa, uma questão neurológica acontecendo dentro da cabeça dessa, desse indivíduo. Uh, mas a gente vai fazer uma análise funcional daquele comportamento e ver a, a, a que função aquele comportamento serve. E se você descobrir que o filho ganha atenção por banging his head e o filho ganha atenção by shouting obscenities and o filho ganha atenção por throwing coisas aos outros filhos e lutando com outros filhos. 
all of those responses are responses maintained by attention, they can all be part of one class, just as the rat's left lever press and right lever press and press with its butt are lever presses. E aí você vê que se aquela criança uh, bate, bate a cabeça para ter atenção, xinga para ter atenção, briga com as pessoas para ter atenção, uh, e ela tem, você vai ver que essas, que essas respostas elas fazem todas parte de uma mesma classe de comportamento. É, seria como pressionar a barra com a pata esquerda, pressionar a barra com a pata direita, pressionar a barra com as duas patas. And, uh, and so if you try just to extinguish one of those, like you just try to extinguish the headbanging and you don't worry about the others, you might have problems because part of the class is still being reinforced. E se você tenta resolver ou colocar em extinção só a resposta ao comportamento de bater a cabeça contra a parede, você pode ter problema, porque só uma parte ou só um, uma, um comportamento dentro daquela classe de comportamentos tá, não está sendo reforçado. E em functional communication, Jim Carr introduces all of these ways in which the child now can interact with others uh, and, uh, and, and therefore. Uh, acquires some power, you, you're empowering the child by giving it ways of communicating uh, and uh, uh, the kinds of things that are potentially important reinforcers, uh, which, which makes the thing work in both directions. It's not just the behavior analyst doing things to the child, the child begins to begin to take control of some things. Com o CAR, então, ele, ele, ele desenvolve esse treinamento de comunicação funcional, onde a criança, não é só o analista do comportamento que, que, que define o, o, o tratamento ou a intervenção com essa criança, mas essa criança começa a ser capaz também de comunicar uh, ao, ao analista do comportamento. Sadly, though, there are also communication problems because there's another procedure which is essentially... Uh, um, uh, well, it's, 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 it's a problematic procedure called facilitated communication, which is uh, uh, people who guide the a child's hands on a keyboard. And uh, the data are unsubstantiated. It's like the old Clever Hans phenomenon with the horse. Remember the Clever Hans from the beginning of the 20th century, the guy who thought he had taught his horse arithmetic? Oh, my God. Do you remember the... There, there was this German uh, horse owner who thought he had taught his yeah, horse. Yeah, yeah, okay. but then, it, yeah. That's called the Clever Hans phenomenon. Oh, the facilitated communication is the same thing that happens in correct contemporary times. And because of the similar names, it's a problem for us because they tend to get mixed up. But let's look at the other things that were going on. We had the founding of the Cambridge Center for the Behavioral Studies in 1981. The Journal of the Analysis of Verbal Behavior begins publication under the editorship of Mark Sunberg. Uh, we have the Behavioral and Brain Sciences Project in which Skinner's, uh, some of Skinner's important papers are published in that journal and then lots of others comment on them and Skinner replies. Uh, Karen Pryor, who had once done work with porpoises, publishes a little book called Don't Shoot the Dog. And essentially it's the beginning of the introduction of clicker training used for animals, which gets the procedures of reinforcement out to a lot of pet owners who begin to learn something about behavior, not because they've taken psychology courses, but because they've actually worked with their pets. Uh, Steve Hayes introduces his relational frame theory without acknowledging the extent to which frames are in Skinner's verbal behavior. And he's essentially taking it off in its own direction. And uh, so that's another one of those things where it goes off somewhere else. And as far as I'm concerned, it's not part of behavior analysis. So I won't spend any time with that. Yeah, let me just translate that. Okay, just <laughs> not all of it necessarily. But oh, yeah, just the end. Uh, e aí, no, nos anos 80, começa a acontecer tudo isso que vocês estão vendo. E o último, por exemplo, ele pega e fala sobre o Reis desenvolvendo, uh, introduzindo a teoria das molduras relacionais. Uh, e é um exemplo de, de, de ramos que <coughs> coisas que vão ramificando e na verdade deixam de ser análise do comportamento que é o caso do que ele diz aqui do, da teoria de dos, das molduras relacionais. So what, hap what else happens during that <coughs> decade? 
The Fred Keller School is established uh, by uh, Doug Greer at Teachers College at Columbia. <coughs> uh, that's Doug in the in the back row there. He has an answer. And that's right Fred Keller right. and and his wife Frances and students there. And that that has been growing and growing and growing. One of the great behavior analysis researchers in the field of education. Is is, uh, Doug Greer, da, do, do Teachers College, <laughs> Universidade de Columbia com a esposa dele, com, que está desenvolvendo <coughs> vários trabalhos hoje em análise de comportamento no mundo. Charlie, Doug Greer never, never answered my emails. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. Send it to him again. <laughs> might have happened like the email. Might have happened like the email of mine. You didn't answer. I am <laughs> sorry. <laughs> try true. again. Try again. No, I, I'll uh, try again. <laughs> and copy to me as well, and I'll, I'll forward and get and make sure he responds. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, he's got a, he, he has a lot to keep up with too. I know. Yeah, I'm it, so sorry. I'll never I'll never leave an email of yours again without answering. Okay. I missed it. I swear. I just missed it. Uh, I don't believe it. Here's Fred Keller with Ellie Reese. Um, Ellie is uh, was an early contributor to. Uh, uh, to behavior analysis and um, uh, uh, <clears throat> again, I'm trying to think of the. Uh, she she taught at Mount Holyoke College, um, and actually, our oldest son Bill had taken Ellie El, Ellie Reese's uh, introductory psychology course. Uh, so, uh, this is Who's well. You Mark? folks should know that. Excuse, excuse me. Whose son? Our older son, oh, our older son the one who was Charlie. in the movies and theater. Yeah, hey, no, uh, had he, he had, um, this is you. Everybody in the audience knows Daisy, right? Yeah, she's here. She's 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 watching us. Daisy, hi. <laughs> hi so this is one of the great pictures, and um, and so uh, and here's Fred Keller doing one of the things that. <laughs> He would really like a a little bit of gin at the end of the day. So this this is a, a Fred Keller gostava de um pouco de gin de gin no final do dia. And this is uh, Fred Keller and 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 Fred Skinner used to occasionally have a session at ABBA meetings in which there'd be a dinner, and at the end of the dinner they'd give a talk in which they'd have these fake fights with each other, and one. Uh, Keller claimed that Skinner stole the idea of the lever from him. Uh, <laughs> and another time, uh, Skinner came out dressed as if he was Pavlov. Uh, it, they they had these very very funny interactions um, in these shows they did at ABBA. <laughs> Nessas fotos nos encontros da ABBA, da ABBA o Fred Skinner e o Fred Keller, os dois Freds, e tinham um jantar e no final do jantar os dois vinham e davam um showzinho particular. Então, por exemplo, em uma situação, o Fred Keller um dia... E eles tinham essas brigas de brincadeira na frente de todo mundo. O Fred Keller olha para o Skinner e diz assim que o Skinner roubou dele a ideia do, de pressionar a barra. No outro, no outra vez, o Skinner vem vestido de Pavlov. E era sempre, sempre uma grande festa, uma diversão. And then here we have Nat Schoenfeld with Emilio Ribas and Fred Keller because a lot has a lot of there are a lot of behavior analysts in Mexico as well, and Emilio has been much involved in that, and both Nat and Fred Keller uh, with them. Um, so now we see that by this time we're we're in this little, getting late into the 80s. We have uh, we've gone international. This is a dinner uh, in uh, uh, with people in Japan. That's uh, uh, Masayo Sato here. Uh, in, in the middle, uh, and this was uh, um, Naoko Sugiyama, who was his wife, and both of them taught behavior analysis in Japan. Sato was the first international uh, president of ABBA. Uh, this is Koichi Ono, who worked in my lab for a while, and got to know Daisy, by the way. Koichi came and worked in the lab. Daisy was already working in the lab. And uh, we found that uh, Koichi was beginning to speak his English with a Portuguese accent. It was more oh, because he was talking to Daisy. Right. So, uh, and the three of us, um, one of the great things was uh, is we, we did a, a paper, which uh, I think it was published in the Brazilian Journal, um, in which we had Koichi and Daisy and me as co-authors. We also had another paper that we published in a journal that was edited by Norwegian. So the international stuff 
is really just great. And here's a little bit more of a sample in which I, sh I wish I had more Brazilian pictures here, but this is a group from Mexico. This is the Skinner Club uh, at, in Norway. This is um, Ice ABBA, the Icelandic uh, ABBA group. Um, I was there at the founding meeting of the Icelandic ABBA. Is that you? Uh, that's me right there, yeah. And, and the second one in the front row. Um, this is the Japanese group with Sato at a poster in an APA meeting, and there's Naoko. Um, and so the 1980s draws to a close, and we close it with a sad item. B.F. Skinner is diagnosed with leukemia, and he actually talks about it in National Public Radio. Um, if you got to choose a terminal disease, you might as well choose leukemia. As long as they change the blood, you're feeling fine, and eventually something takes you away very quickly. He was very frank about life and death, um, <clears throat> but, um, but he learned about his, uh, his uh, leukemia late in the 1980s. É, o Skinner ficou sabendo da leucemia no final da década de 80, e ele era muito claro, assim, muito, muito transparente com relação à vida e à morte. So we, we are getting into then the 1990s, and here again, the end of a century, the end of a millennium. And what happens then? Iraq invades Kuwait and the Gulf War starts. East and West Germany reunite. Nelson Mandela is released from prison and not too many years later, he's elected the president of South Africa. The Soviet Union collapses. There's genocide in Rwanda. Uh, uh, Taliban takeovers in Afghanistan imposes Islamic rule in 1996. India and Pakistan both begin to test nuclear weapons. And then what's happening culturally, you have smartphones and search engines, connections without wires through Wi-Fi. That was, I didn't even know what Wi-Fi meant back in the 90s. You know, we'd heard this thing called Wi-Fi and what are they talking about? There's the internet, the internet. One of the most incredible things that happened in technology was search engines. Nobody conceived of being able to type a word in something and having it search databases that are um, huge. I mean, just um, <laughs> the map of the human genome news completion. All of that's happening in the 1990s. That's the context for what's going on. Uh, computers are becoming more and more a part of everybody's lives. And what was happening in our field? Well, endings. Because during the 1990s, B.F. Skinner died on August 18th, 1990. Just eight days before, he delivered a keynote address uh, in which the American Psychological Association gave the first award uh, for lifetime contributions to psychology. He died uh, the day after he was working on the page proof for the last of his papers, which was published in the American Psychologist. <clears throat> O Skinner morre um dia, imediatamente um dia depois dele ter, dele ter tá, tá verificando a, a versão de prova, né, para fazer a leitura de um artigo que ia ser publicado no what, what journal, sir? Uh, the American Psychologist. No, no, the American. The, 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 the sort of flagship journal for the American Psychological Association. É o jornal <coughs> meio o jornal central da APA. Uh, his death was obscured in the news because it was also the, the date on which uh, uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And that was all over the newspapers. So Skinner's obituaries were way in the back of the newspaper. <coughs> é, a, a morte do, do Skinner acaba sendo ofuscada na mídia pela invasão do Kuwait. Kuwait, Kuwait, Kuwait. E, e acaba ficando lá na, na, nas partes finais do jornal, na parte do, de obituário. Fred Keller dies on February 2nd, 1996. Nat Schoenfeld died the same year on August 3rd, 1996. So, in that one decade, we lost the three most important founders of our field. Em uma so, década, os três principais <coughs> fundadores do do nosso campo, a gente perde os três principais fundadores do nosso campo. A number of us were invited to, to uh, write pieces for the special issue of the American Psychologist 
devoted to Skinner. I still find it strange that I ended up, I, I ended up with this title. I mean, it was the behavior of organisms, B.F. Skinner organism. Could have called them B.F. Skinner psychologist, B.F. Skinner behavior analyst, but uh, this title really works. Uh, he, because we are all organisms. And uh, the, so, um, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. E, e, né, na, uma edição especial, American Psychologist, que a, o periódico da APA fez uma edição especial sobre o Skinner e muitos foram convidados <coughs> para escrever, e o Charlie foi um deles, e o Charlie ficou com esse, com esse título né, interessante de BF Skinner Organismo, fazendo uma brincadeira com o título do livro, né, Comportamento dos Organismos, e que caiu muito bem porque todos somos organismos, né? And I'm showing off a little bit by showing my connections here, but these, these were my teachers and uh, um, right from the very beginning and we're carrying on what they did. And uh, it sometimes makes my, well, it doesn't stand up very long because I haven't had a haircut in a very long time, <laughs> but, but it is, it is um, um, this is a very personal thing as well as a academic thing. Um, e eu, eu posso estar tá, tá me gabando um pouco aqui por estar tá mostrando a minha conexão com eles, mas é, o Charlie dizendo, né? Mas eu, eu estou conectado porque eles foram meus professores, então falar sobre eles e falar sobre isso para mim é algo muito pessoal. And I, as you know, I was involved in helping to get Fred Keller's autobiography published. Who could have imagined when I walked into his introductory psychology course that I'd ever be in a position to, to have done something like that. Um, and that Schoenfeld was um, uh, perhaps in, in terms of, of individual contact, my most important teacher because I was his teaching assistant at one time. And um, it's just been a great privilege to be in the middle of all of this. And um, so that was the 1990s. What else was going on? Well, more beginnings. Skinner used to talk about us as we happy few. There were so few behavior analysts um, that, you know, everybody could know everybody. Now it's become a huge, huge, uh, 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 a huge uh, uh, thing. Um, behavior analysis, as I said earlier, it's beginning to emerge from its eclipse, but everything is harder to keep up with. There's an explosion of applications. There's still controversies. I mentioned facilitated communication, which still comes up as a way in which some people are trying to get people to spend money on their autistic, uh, on the children on the autism spectrum. Um, but in the meantime, there is the founding of behavior, the BACB, the Behavior Analysis Certification Board. Uh, Jerry Shook, much involved in that. Behavior analysis programs are beginning to be established in different universities. So for example, in 1999, at my campus, UMBC, we had created a joint uh, ABA master's track with the Kennedy Krieger Institute. And uh, we had our first student that was accepted in 1999. The program has been continuing since and now has maybe um, a dozen to maybe 18 students coming in every year. And so we've been turning, and I did the calculation. Well, that's 20 years, roughly. So over that time, we've uh, we perhaps turned out uh, some hun several hundred uh, behavior applied behavior analysts. Um, I think along the way, I mentioned that it was a reunion at the Kennedy Krieger Institute that Mike Cataldo had set up for people who had taken postdocs there that inspired this whole project. Um, Because at one point he showed a map of the United States and all of the, the places in which uh, people from that one program had worked. And it was at that point that Vic Ladies and I realized that, that this, the history of our field is not about this person's theory or that person's theory. It's about the science evolving to create a technology and, and that being the definition of what makes a science. Um, Uh, Louis Pasteur wrote this, there does not exist a category of science to which one can give the name of applied sciences. There are sciences and the applications of science 
bound together as the fruit of the tree which bears it. Or, as he said it more succinctly somewhere else, there are no such things as applied sciences, only applications of science. And that's what we all do. And many of us do both of those things. We do the basics. We do research sometimes in applied settings, which turns out to be basic stuff. Sidman got to the equivalence classes because he was working with kids who were in those days called retarded children. We don't call them that anymore. But he ended up doing this basic work. And then, and, and I've just mentioned that we've lost Skinner and we've lost Keller and we've lost Schoenfeld. Uh, we have so many people I could mention, uh, and I'm going to show some names, uh, some of them still with us, some of them not. Um, this is uh, Pauline Horn and Fergus Lowe. I worked with Fergus when I spent the sabbatical year in Wales. Uh, this is Tony Nevin and Bud Mace. Uh, uh, we lost, from the, when I first prepared this talk in an earlier version, Tony was still alive. He died uh, about a year ago uh, of cancer. Uh, and the, here we have Phil Heinlein, Mark Branch, Lanny Fields, and Alan Norringer, all of us still with us. This shows Vic Ladies who did die this past year. There's Peter Colleen and, and Celia Gershenson, all active in the early days. Uh, Celia was a student at Columbia, one of the few women around in the program to get a master's and to get degrees with, with Nat Schoenfeld and, and Fred Keller. Um, and just to try to get some of the people in, I mean, these are, these are people many of you will know. Um, uh, Eric Arntzen in Norway, and there's Ted Ione, and Nate Azrin, and B. Barrett, and Sid Bijou, Joe Brady. I could just go on through this list, but I, uh, I won't take the time to show all of them, but they're all people who have made their various contributions. It is nice to see that uh, there are many women, even from the early days of behavior analysis, not as many as in proportion to the population, but they're becoming more and more active in the field. Um, uh, I think, believe Judy LeBlanc is in here. Her daughter, Linda, is now the editor of Java. Um, the, uh, uh, um, the, the, um, many of these people have uh, uh, memoirs in this series of books published by the Cambridge Center. So I promised uh, when I first did this that we give them a plug. Uh, people there who tell their stories um, and so what do we have now? We're in the 20th century. Um, what happens in the 21st, 21st century now? We finished the 20th century. We actually got there. You surprised? I am. Um, there was supposed to be this crisis, the Y2K computer crisis, uh, but it didn't come to pass. Where do we go from here? Subgroups go spinning off in different directions, and we don't have to pick winners or losers. Let's not worry about it. The future will strengthen those people who can do their science effectively. We who still call ourselves behavior analysis, whether a basic or, or applied, we're all winners. Of course, we've been able to be part of this story. They now talk about translational research. They tell the basic folks, do some research that will translate to the applied stuff or the, the applied stuff, do some research that will translate to the basic. They were always part of the same field. And behavior analysis can exist on its own. It doesn't have to be part of a psychology department or some other department like speech therapy or this or that. It's our science now. Thank you. Wow, Charlie. Uh, I'm, I'm like, I know everybody's clapped in here for you. Let me just bring Daisy real quick. Uh, and we could, if you want, we could take a little time on questions. Oh, that would be awesome, Charlie. Because so, I'm bringing should I, on. should I close down the shared screen and then yeah, bring sure, up a, bring up the screen so that we can yes. uh, yeah, Charlie. Like, uh, but I I would like just to take the, the chance. Oh, absolutely! I would love to see like Daisy. The, no, uh, I just want to thank you. I mean, this this has been awesome. Well, it's been fun for me. That's awesome. I remember when we first, when I first wrote you and um, about like a talk and you were so generous to, to offer this beautiful workshop, uh, which has, has, has inspired so many people. 
Uh, então, I'm just gonna translate and tell people how the context sure. Foi muito interessante quando a gente primeiro entrou em contato com o Charlie. Né? Eu mandei um e-mail para ele totalmente. A Karina, a Karina falou assim: ah, manda um e-mail para o Charles Catania. Ah, vamos mandar, né? E ele foi. E, e, e a ideia era uma proposta. O início era um. um como vocês conhecem, a Psicologia no Sofá era uma palestra de 45 minutos, uma hora. E o Charlie foi muito generoso. Primeiro, primeiro momento, assim, o primeiro e-mail que ele... I'd probably be, be, be embarrassed if I understood everything you said. <risos> ele disse que ele ia ficar com vergonha se ele entendesse. It's nothing, it's none that I haven't told you yet. <risos> uh, e, e ele foi, foi muito generoso desde o primeiro minuto, desde o primeiro instante, dizendo, olha... Legal, posso sim, mas de repente eu tenho esse projeto aqui que eu estou fazendo, que era para eu dar em tal lugar e não vai acontecer mais por conta do coronavírus. O que, que você acha? É uma aula que pode ser de três a quatro horas. Imagina se, se a gente ia falar não para o Charles Catani. E ele foi super generoso, né? Deu essa aula aí de quase dez horas e vocês participaram. Deixa eu ver se a professora Daisy está aqui. A senhora está aqui, professora? Just checking with Daisy. So let me just read some. So people are, they're clapping their hands for you. They're... Daisy. So good to see you. It's very good to see you, Charlie. I am here, emotional, as uh, everybody else. Um, uh, Myron mentioned your generosity in giving this all these talks, I'd like to stress that uh, generosity is one feature of your behavior all the time. You share all that you, you, you share all that you produced, all that you learned. So uh, it's been great to listen to you and, uh, and in your final slides, we all got very emotional about what you were showing us and about what you were talking. It's great to see you. Thank you so much on my part, but I, I know about uh, lots of Brazilians, students, uh, friends, colleagues that uh, were following you those days. And uh, I am sure that's been a great experience for all of them. It, it's, it was, incredible for me. I was your student at UMBC. I went to many of your classes to the undergraduate students, but it's always a pleasure to, to hear you and to learn with you. It's incredible. It's, well, it, it's amazing. Thank you so much. It, it was well, thank you. very, very good. I just want to read, uh, so there's this comment that somebody just sent. Uh, her name is Natalia, and she's saying, I'm really impressed uh, at all your knowledge uh, and, and how, how easy you, it is and how, how easy it, you, make it, you make it seem or uh, such a difficult subject as the history of a science with this comprehension. And then she says, Charlie, I can strongly say that this was one of the best classes that I have ever had about behaviorism, science, and history in my entire life. I want to thank you and the team of Psicologia and Sofá for the opportunity. And then she's got a question. Okay. <laughs> Lastly, I would like to know if it, it is in your plans to write uh, one book about the history of the evolution of science. I think it's the book that you and Vic have had yes, yes. been writing, in right? Fact, in fact, the... In the the book, the plans for the book existed before uh, doing this talk. Um, and <clears throat> well, actually it was, I, I said it just a little bit at the very beginning in the very first uh, session, which is that I began work with my colleague, Victor Lates. Uh, he and I go back a long ways in the field. And after I had been to that uh, reunion that Cataldo um, had held for the Kennedy Krieger Institute, I, I suddenly had this picture of the field as, um, as expanding and the story being not about 
I've, I've read the histories of psychology and histories of other fields in which you get, this person did that experiment and this person did that. And then there was this political fight in this department. And then there was this other kind of story. But, but I saw the story as not being these theories that were battling with each other, but rather as being the field developing more and more things that worked and the and the applications coming along with it Did, should i do you need to translate that or you can just go or, ahead you think it's okay right. um and so vic and i began talking about how it would work and the 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 most important idea was well two well not there were several things about it we felt that we should put things in the context of what was going on in the rest of the world so Skinner's Project Pigeon, in which he discovers shaping, goes on during World War II. Fred Keller is actually driving, is learning te the telegraph, the Morse code stuff, and then he's driving ammunition trucks in World War I, and then in World War II, he's teaching Morse code to American soldiers who have been drafted into the military for World War II. Um, if you look at the 50s, uh, there's the Cold War starting, and Chomsky is interested in using this to get money for language translation, to get money into linguistics. And he's competing with these behaviorists who, if they get the money instead, will not allow him to do what he wants to do. So this battle between the cognivists and the behaviorists. So all of these historical events are figuring into the things that are happening in our field. So that's part of the story. And, and also when I used to teach this as a course, I would be, I would get to telling something about what happened during World War II and I would realize there'd be some students who didn't even know who was fighting whom. And so we figured, okay, we have to tell it in the context. And the one draft of this book that exists in fairly complete form is every chapter is a decade and every chapter begins with a, a uh, two or three paragraphs in italics which give the background history of in what's going on in the world uh, into, uh, but I, then I, then then my colleague Vic ladies was developing alzheimer's and getting more and more ill and he could no longer write and at that point then i was very fortunate to have been talking to nancy neef who's at ohio state and who's a former java editor and she and I had done some collaborative research using Skype uh, in which her students did projects working in the, in the school system and uh, there. And so I'd gotten to know her and her students. And when Vic could no longer write, I figured I really don't want the responsibility of, I'm gonna leave out a person or I'm gonna, I want somebody else working with me. And since she was a Java person besides, uh, when she came on board as the third author, that really tied things together. And it turned out she was working on a chronology of applied behavior analysis and autism. And so it all just fit together. So yes, the book is in progress. Uh, what was the name of the person who wrote that comment? Natalia. Natalia? Natalia? The book will be published eventually. <laughs> I will try to stay well enough to make sure I finish it. You better be. You better be. I will try to. And, uh, <laughs> I'm going to and... translate that. Então, sim, o livro, uh, esse, essa palestra, na verdade, surgiu antes, o livro surgiu antes da ideia dessa aula. When she hears about it, tell her to get in touch with me and I'll send her an autographed copy. Ah, oh, Natália. Quando você ouvir sobre o livro, é para você entrar em contato com ele, ele vai te mandar uma cópia autografada do livro. É, esse livro, então, surgiu naquele, naquele primeiro congresso, ou naquela primeira reunião, reunião que eles organizaram dos formandos do programa que ele desenvolveu, junto com aquela instituição Kennedy Kruger, em uh, análise aplicada do comportamento. Ali ele e o Vic Leiris perceberam que, que na verdade, o, o campo... De, da análise do comportamento tinha crescido de maneira absurda é, e eles quiseram colocar essa história de bem contextualizada e ele percebeu eles perceberam que 
quando eles davam aula, na verdade, o Charlie percebeu, quando ele dava aula sobre análise do comportamento e, e, e a história da análise do comportamento, muita gente não sabia do contexto. É, então, ele, ele, ele achou importante colocar o contexto e, e até para olhar sobre é, para análise do comportamento a partir do contexto. Por exemplo, um, o Skinner desenvolvendo aquele projeto lá do, 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 do Pombo Guia, desenvolvendo, descobrindo a modelagem no contexto da Segunda Guerra Mundial, o Fred Keller trabalhando no telégrafo no, na Western Union enquanto novo, dirigindo caminhão de munição na Primeira Guerra, mas na Segunda ensinando o código Morse que ele tinha aprendido lá quando ele era um office boy do telégrafo. Um, isso tudo trazendo dentro do contexto histórico. E o livro ele é organizado desse jeito. Os capítulos têm, no, logo no começo do livro, tem alguns para... no começo de cada capítulo tem alguns parágrafos dando contexto histórico do que estava que acontecendo para então falar uh, da história. E no meio desse processo, o Vic Leiris uh, teve Alzheimer, faleceu recentemente, uh, e aí o, o Charlie não queria a responsabilidade toda para ele sozinho de desenvolver esse projeto. E é quando ele convidou então a Nancy Nier, que, que era a editora do Java e é uma pessoa que estava mais envolvida com essa questão aplicada, que por coincidência estava desenvolvendo um, 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 uma, uma, todo um trabalho cronológico da análise aplicada do comportamento, ele convidou ela para entrar como terceira autora desse livro, ela topou e aí ele, 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 ele conhecia o trabalho da Nancy, ele tinha trabalhado com a Nancy, que, que é nessa tá na Universidade de Ohio, uh, com, com alunos no contexto escolar e aplicação, e, e aí ela integrou o livro também. Uh, did he get it all right, Daisy? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, it, I think he did. I, I think that's very enough. good. But I, he just mentioned um, applied behavior analysis. And I think that from your lesson, we should begin talking about applications of behavior analysis. We, sh we should change our vocabulary. It, it's so important, it's so relevant. So that, that was a great point in, in your class. So I would like to propose to the ones who are okay. still around here that we try to change our vocabulary and the way okay. we think about this. That's beautiful. Works for me. <laughs> yep. It's interesting because the way you ended by saying like, there's not, there's not like an applied field that is disconnected from. from that was Pasteur that said it, not me. Pasteur. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what Daisy is saying, I think, I think this can be a very historical moment where us, where we're all. So we have a lot of professors here in behavior analysis. Uh, we we have had. We have had the, for example, I, I got emails, uh, an email from the president, the current president of uh, ABPMC, which is the Brazilian Association for Behavioral uh, Psychology, Giovanna, she, she emailed and she was here. Uh, we got Daisy, yeah, obviously she's like the international rep, uh, representative for us. We have a lot of people from uh, well, from Universidade de Londrina, which is a hub in behavior analysis in Brazil. We have people from UNB, which is another hub of behavior analysis in Brazil. We have DAISY and a lot of people from UFSCar, which is another hub of analysis behavior in Brazil. And just just maybe here we can really start this, this culture. Oh, we got people from Pará. Definitely, we got Alcir and Lisiane who are now in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, we got people from Mexico. We got people from Colombia. Uh, so I think this, from all over Brazil, so this is definitely a historic moment where we can start talking now, not anymore as like applied, but the applications. I think Daisy, that, that observation is really precious. I learned that from Charlie many years ago. <laughs> you Fred would be, Fred would be you. so proud and so happy. Fred Keller and, and yeah. the other Fred and that. I mean, yes, they would, for sure. They for sure. Fred. Hey, uh, Charlie, uh, I'm suffering from bereavement because I don't want this to end. 
It's been well, so great. And people are I'll saying you, that too. I don't want this to end. <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you a secret. <laughs> tell me. I was really surprised that we finished on time. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I, I never... didn't think I didn't think it would be possible to get it all in, but but I think and 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 of course you have to keep moving there with the translation too. So um, we still have our inter and we have our secret little project, right? I'm gonna talk to. I'm also gonna tell Daisy about that. Is that okay? Oh, sure. you know what I'm talking about? Your T-shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is happening, Charlie. It, it, happening. For those who should, do you want to say to everybody, anybody else? Can I, if you let me, if you let but, me. I mean, this, this, this t-shirt is, well, I, okay. Um, <laughs> is a t-shirt that was used in a presentation of a show based on the music from West Side Story. And it was called Behavior Side Story. And it was, um, <clears throat> it was a story about a young guy named Tony who, uh, who is a cognitivist and who, who then meets uh, Maria, who's a behaviorist, uh, and she then wants to bring him over from the cognitive side to the behavior side, and that's what makes a behavior side story. And in the course of it, they sing various songs, and um, one of them is uh, the song "Behavior," which uh, which is, is, based which on is inspired in the song "Maria." Behavior. Behavior, 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 behavior. I'll never stop saying behavior. <laughs> the most powerful word I ever heard. And anyway, we, so I, I shouldn't be singing. Phil Heinlein should be singing, but we actually did do, the, do a show. And, uh, oh, and I was there. You, you, you saw it, that show, didn't you? Yes, I was okay, there. So. That was great. We're gonna do Say it loud and there's no escaping. Say it soft and it's almost like shaping. Behavior. I'll never stop saying behavior. <laughs> the most thing. powerful word I ever heard. But uh, anyway. Oh, Charlie, but, but okay. Who sings Maria is Tony in the actual West Side Story. But Tony is in your story. He's a cognitivist. Yeah, but he comes over. Oh, okay, and that's, oh, gotcha. I mean, that's the whole point. He, she, she brings him over to the behavior side sure. and, and, and persuades him that Mastermind Chomsky <laughs> is not one to be followed because Chomsky is the leader of the cognitive stuff. He's, he's, Let their, me translate he's their mastermind, you see. He's a mentalist. <laughs> he's a mental. Let me translate this, Charlie. This is awesome. Now, don't worry about translating. <laughs> oh, you huh? become for the other folks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, o, ah, o segredo que eu estava dizendo é que antes, antes da gente entrar ao vivo, eu estava conversando. And he has to sing it now, right, Daisy? <laughs> Charlie, oh, I'm going to show, show off. I'm going to sing. <laughs> no, é... oh, it, it's com, what's comportamento? Comportamento. Comportamento? You, it, I yeah, guess it doesn't we'll quite to. rhyme with, it doesn't go with Maria, does it? We'll have to we'll have to to create That's a Brazilian be a problem. Version. The translation is. Be a <laughs> uh, e, e a história, na verdade, tem, tem esse musical muito famoso que acontece em Nova York. O Charlie cresceu em Nova York. Se chama West Side Story. É um musical da Broadway. Tem filme. Super recomendo vocês assistirem. E a gente estava conversando hoje antes de começar e ele falou sobre esse musical. Na verdade, eu olhei a camiseta e eu reconheci. Que, que é o mesmo, o mesmo logo do West Side Story. Eu perguntei para ele, falei, Charlie, essa camiseta tem alguma coisa a ver com West Side Story? Aí ele disse que ele e o Heinlein criaram, e na verdade tem um livro e as músicas, eles fizeram as músicas do musical, onde o Tony é um cognitivista, e na, no West Side Story o Tony é um americano, gringo, e, e ele se apaixona pela Maria, que na, na, no análogo é uma behaviorista, e na história, no original, Maria é uma hispana vivendo em Nova York. E aí é uma história, um conto, uma história de Romeo e Julieta moderna, West Side Story, é, quase. E, e o Charlie fez, ele me mandou o livro. E a Daisy disse que assistiu, né, Daisy? Ele, ele e o Heinlein fizeram uma apresentação, um show num dos congressos da ABBA, 
numa, numa espécie de, de atividade que substituía aqueles, aquele show do, dos dois Freds do Fred. depois do jantar. É. Então, ele mandou o livro, ele mandou o teatro, a peça e as músicas e eu falei para ele que a gente vai fazer. Não sei como que a gente, quando, quando for safe de novo abrir teatros, essas coisas, a gente vai fazer. Já tá aqui guardadinho. I saved that in my computer, Charlie. The book and the lyrics. Okay. We're gonna do it. I'm gonna ask you. What I'll never first. know is, is whether uh, the, the two friends and out would have approved of my talking with this outfit instead of wearing a jacket and tie. Well, <laughs> they lived great. in a different generation. But <clears throat> anyway. You're looking great, Charlie. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I think this is it. Okay. Thank if there are questions, we, if there are you questions, have, you've got time I, for more questions. I, I would say that maybe, unless it's a, you think that you've seen from the list that there's a, there's any prominent one that should be answered. Otherwise, I recommend that people could send them to you, and then you could forward them to me, and I could try sure. to do my email, and we can try. I to will do that. that. Um, I will do that. So then we can work on the questions. Pessoal, eu vou pedir para vocês. É, mandarem, podem mandar as perguntas. Eu vou pedir para vocês, se vocês mandam no meu e-mail, eu demoro muito mais para ver e às vezes eu não vejo. Então manda no psicologia no sofá, gmail.com, que a gente consegue organizar melhor as perguntas ali. Isso, ó, a Gabi já, já colocou o e-mail aqui, psicologia no sofá, gmail.com. Um, e, e a gente vai, vai compilar elas. É, eu já vou fazer uma entrevista com o Charlie daqui, um, daqui uns dias para o nosso Psicologia no Sofá e onde a gente, ele vai contar um pouco mais dessas histórias e vai ser meio que uma abreviação, talvez, do que a gente viu nesses dias. Quero aproveitar para agradecer a professora Daisy por mais eu que uma agradeço. vez. Sou eu quem agradece. Uma grande oportunidade. Parabéns a vocês por esse trabalho tão bonito e por terem conseguido trazer o Charlie para falar para todo mundo. Obrigado, Obrigado. Good to see you, Daisy. Thank you. Thank you, And, uh, Charlie. It was wonderful seeing you. Okay, Hope we'll to see you again this. soon. Okay. Great. Charlie, thank you so much. And I'll talk to you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Tchau, pessoal. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.